Oh, hello there. What's going on? Yeah, we're back once again. I know you fucking hate it, but, uh, you know, <gasps> just have to get on with it, won't you? It's absolutely fine. It's just not cricket. So why is it not cricket? Is it golf? Why is it just cricket? Can't it be bowling? It's such a weird, a weird thing to say in the old British language. Uh, but we are here today to bring you the 88th edition of the Chronicles of Podcasts, aren't we, Jamie? Is that right? 88? Oh, yeah. 88? Yeah. Well, 12 away from 100. Absolutely insane. I do believe that even though it's not cricket or golf or whatever sport you want to make sure it's not, um, but these right here, the Chronicles of Faith Elizabeth? Yeah, they are. Absolutely wonderful. Well, I'll hit it. Hit it! Hey, honey bunny, it's Rivka Reyes. This is Ron Wasserman, the nut that wrote Go Go Power Rangers. It's Boba Fett here. This is Molly Rennick from Living Dead Girl. It's WWE superstar legend, Davy Boy Smith's daughter, Georgia Smith. Hi, I'm Faith Elizabeth. I am an actress and director and apparently do it all. And I am on the Chronicles of Podcast today with Tom and Jamie talking shit and hopefully saying some good things that are going to sit in your heart and change your life. Why? You should have carried on. You could have been kicking some serious ass at the same time as acting. Boys and girls, join us as we bring you the Chronicles of Faith Elizabeth. But while we're here, Jamie, I think uh, I think we should bring that piece in. Oh, we definitely should bring that piece in. I think we've talked a lot of bollocks. Welcome to the Chronicles of Faith Elizabeth. <laughs> Faith Elizabeth is an incredible independent actor and filmmaker and the owner of Faithful Films. She is currently promoting an incredible heart-wrenching movie called My Baby Cries. You're going to find out all about it in this movie. You're also going to find out about her amazing Yes, She Can movement, which she just went and did at the Cannes Film Festival after we had this interview, but just before it's coming out now. This is a wonderful conversation it is very heart-wrenching at times it's very deep at times it's very dark at times but my god i'm so grateful to faith for sitting there and telling it telling these stories that cannot be easy to tell let's be honest at the end of the day it cannot be easy to tell these stories and it means the absolute world that she trusted in us to tell us these things and just go out there and support faith because this is amazing i love this conversation so much yeah, exactly. Faith, enjoy Ibiza. As I know, you're out there right now as we record this, and I imagine you'll still be there when it's released on Friday. Uh, this is Tuesday night, just so let everyone know. Uh, please go support the Yes You Can charity that uh, Faith represents. Um, and yeah, and we hope you enjoy Cannes Film Festival. We hope you all enjoy this interview. It, Like Jamie said, it's very in-depth. It's very insightful. Uh, and obviously talks about a very serious injury she had that could have cost her her career. Uh, and didn't she didn't stop. She persevered and smashed it out the fucking park. This is a great interview. And I'm very excited for you all to hear it. Jamie! Yes, sir. Any final words? Just a massive thank you to Faith. Just to repeat what I said then. The fact you trusted in us to tell us these stories means the absolute world. I absolutely love this conversation. Like Tom said, this is absolutely amazing. People enjoy this one. Absolutely. Ladies and gentlemen, here we go. Ladies and gentlemen, interviewing this week, it's Faith Elizabeth. Ah. Ladies and gentlemen, today we bring you another wonderful guest with another wonderful and inspiring story. This week's guest is a living embodiment of never giving up and chasing your dreams. She's an actor, filmmaker, is an empowering women all in the world of cinema by saying, yes, we can. She played Scar in The Lion King. She's walked the streets of Albert Square. She's even been in a Nando's advert. Boys and girls, join us as we bring you the Chronicles of Faith Elizabeth. <laughs> absolutely amazing faith thank you so much for taking the time on monday evening as you say to uh to join us we really do appreciate it but i think we should start with the really the real hard hitting stuff which was how was the last few years been how was your pandemic season oh god do you know i 
I feel like everybody says the same thing, right? Because we all had a very different experience, but we all had the same thing, didn't we, with the pandemic? I mean, for me, it wasn't that bad in the end because I spent a lot of time sitting in a paddling pool drinking gin in my swimming costume. So it was, it was, it was all right. I got <laughs> just, yeah kind of write and create um and not worry too much about the pressure of feeling like you have to be uh, achieving a lot or earning a lot of money because there wasn't really that opportunity um but I bought a dog which was nice and I spent loads of time with my daughter which was nice so I know that there was like all the crap and the rubbish stuff and the worrying and all that kind of nonsense but I feel like at this end of it I'm like you know there was rough with the smooth in the end and I think it pushed me in in ways that I don't know if I would have accelerated my career as quickly because I think it made a lot of people sort of realize like what do I actually want to do with my life um and sort of take control and stop thinking that especially in the film industry your career often feels like it's in other people's hands um Mm. and I was like yeah I don't know if I can spare on this podcast but I was like fuck it I'm not gonna sit around um and just let life go by and then we could all just die tomorrow from some crazy pandemic illness or something. So, yeah, I feel like I've come out the other end better and stronger, even if it was like a bad dream that went on for way too long. <laughs> <laughs> it's so na- I, um You're more than welcome to swear, by the way. We we do as well. We always we always get a feel of the guests first before we start, you know, banging the shits <laughs> and fucks and so on. <laughs> Um, um, what, what, that's great. Um, what, what dog did you get? Um, she's a multi poo, so she's a Maltese poodle cross. Um, oh. she's a teddy bear dog. She's like this big and the most adorable thing ever. Um, I don't know how I managed to find my like soulmate in a dog because she like lies in bed and sleeps with me when I don't want to get up. But then when I do get up, she's like, what are we doing today? Yay. <laughs> so it's like the perfect mixture of little ball of fluff. So, yeah. Oh, that's lush. What's her name? Oh, God. So uh, her name is Princess Coco Chanel. That's her, that's her legal name. Okay. Um, <laughs> the thing is, no, because like I get so much grief about this. My dad was like, I'm not having some weird name that I have to like scream across the field when you inevitably ask me to look after her. So we went through all these different names and he was like, you're not calling her. My daughter wants to call her Blossom, which he sounded like Bosom or Bottom or something. He was like, I'm not doing that. So we went through these different names. And then I said, well, if we call her Coco, then you are happy to say Coco and I can call her Princess. So, you know, it's a win-win. And... Eventually, over time, we ended up calling her like Koki and stuff. But my dad is the only one that actually calls her Princess Coco Chanel. He's the only one that says to her like Koki, Woki, Woki. And I'm like, you're the one that made me try and come up with a name that was like dad safe. And you're the one that's like. I love it. It's a classic. It's a classic male thing to do. It's not like fucking animals don't want them. What do you mean? I don't know. No, bollocks. And then all of a sudden it's like. (laughs) Yes. Yeah, he's the only one that lets lets Coco lick his face as well, and I'm like, I love her to pieces, but I'm not going to do that. And he'll sit there, and he doesn't like it, but he'll like be like, I'm doing this because I love her, and he'll be like scrunching his face up, and he's like, I'm like, Dad, you don't have to let her do that. And he's like, No, she seems so happy when she gets to lick my face, and her little tongue goes like in his nose or in his ear, and he's like, Like, it's not, it's not a re- requesty that you have to let her lick your innards, but. What you do for love, eh? Phenomenal, <laughs> absolutely phenomenal. <laughs> oh, lick your innards off to a flyer. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I love that. That's all I can say. They both sit there with a grin. So, yeah, they're <laughs> good to me, right? <laughs> oh, I love that so much. Oh, well, take us back to the start. What did young Miss Elizabeth wish to be when she was growing up? Was it always acting and performing, or? Something completely different, like train driver. I don't know. No, no, I, yeah, I was always into acting and like putting on little shows in front of the family. There's actually the first time I was ever on camera recorded on like one of those home videos that my dad bought one of the cameras and we're all sat there in the lounge and we're all um, 
recording ourselves and we can see ourselves on the TV and we've still got it and I watch it now and I'm looking at it and I'm thinking I knew I was acting then even in the way that I was behaving to the camera um I I knew that it was like a performance and I did it on purpose and it was a whole orchestrated thing um but I also went through a time where I was like I want to be a lawyer I want to be a police officer I want to be all these really cool things and then I was like but you know if I'm an actor I can be all of those things but without having to like study or anything I can do like the pretending fun bit where you get to dress up and look cool and like throw the book at someone or whatever but then I don't actually have to do the hard part which is like paperwork or the legals or any of that so I kind of figured it was something I really enjoyed but also like best of both worlds you know so I like that that's great I want to do all these things then I'll pretend to do all these things and get paid for it yes (laughs) have you actually have you played a lawyer police officer yet I actually haven't funnily enough not quite there yet like I don't know I think I'm actually age wise in in the right space like you do see sometimes those like younger police officers but I don't know I kind of see myself as a police officer more like um you know like in a suit as opposed to like on the beat see I can't even look I'd have been such a shit police officer wouldn't I like I don't even know the terminology like a I don't know like a murder investigator kind of police officer yeah yeah detective undercover or something yeah yeah, I wasn't like into like the bun and the police hat and that kind of vibe. But yeah, like the, someone's getting murdered and I'm just like rocking up, like taking charge of this, the, the crime scene. I think that's the vibe. Really cool. Get the, flip the old notepad, lick the pencil, write us going on here. Yeah. <laughs> Get my face like right up against the dead body, like, hmm, who's done this? <laughs> Love it. I'm closer inspection. <laughs> This is yogurt, not semen. <laughs> <laughs> Malicious, this. <laughs> oh, oh, come on. <laughs> sorry, sorry. <laughs> Where did that love for performance come from? Were you a, a dramatic child or the family in the business? And if, or did you just... I just... It was like you know, in my blood, I think. Like, I was at school, we would put on little shows together and, if like, drama was my favourite subject and it was just something I just did all the time just as part of who I was before really understanding. I think that there was a weird permission to, like, be someone different and just be in a different headspace and a different world that I really liked. So, um. I would really push all my characters to being like really kind of extreme versions of things. Um, It wasn't so much like sitting there pretending to be a princess kind of thing. It Mm. was, yeah, like maybe, I don't know, like, you know, we're all in a family and and mummy's left us alone in the house and we're going to pretend that we have to survive because we've been abandoned and we're neglected children. It was like that kind of, maybe I had like such a like loving, supportive, happy family that I was like acting out some kind of weird, like opposite end spectrum. So I don't know where that came from. I had this idea for this book I was going to write as well about these kids that woke up one day and the world, everyone in the world had disappeared. Um, and they had to sort of work out how to survive. And it was going to have a black cover and it was going to have a question mark on the front. Um, and I was going to play the, the girl in the book. Um, and she'd be like with her sister. And I was thinking about it years later and I was like, I, think I was about 11 when I was thinking of that concept. Like that's pretty deep for like an 11 year old who, yeah, she should probably be doing going tea parties or something like not like i'm gonna pretend i've been abandoned in the world and it's like the apocalypse or something <laughs> totally right yeah it's a little bit but anyone listening to trademark faithfulism you're not stealing this idea because it's yeah. gonna happen it's a great story you gotta do it now <laughs> yeah we will see I, I sometimes think about it i think i've got the notebook somewhere where i like was writing so i keep things i'm like a keeper of stuff i like to keep little bits of like you know when you're 10 and you drew a picture and it's like in my drawer somewhere and um, so i might have to dig it out at some point but we'll see i think the story needs a bit more developing from jamie alluded to the fact that you um played scar so you did your own production the lion king and raised money for the world wildlife fund yeah and out of every character you could have chosen why scar <laughs> 
because like Scar is so freaking cool. Like he's like he's like powerful and interesting and like you know Simba and stuff is like oh I want to be king oh maybe not oh. I feel <laughs> like Nala is like the love interest like oh so boring playing love interests like I've been I've done a few of them over my years and I'll probably do a few more but when it's just the love interest it's just a tag along kind of role whereas Scar was like the center of the of the film and I got this like black wig with white streaks in it because I didn't have black hair at the time and I had this like cat suit thing and I was in a box and I jumped out and I was like scaring everyone and it was like just like the polar opposite of this like quiet shy girl that was just kind of you know didn't really have any friends and just kind of sat in the corner and didn't really get involved and then the next thing you know I'm just like leaping out of this box and all these grown-ups are like what is wrong with this child and I'm like oh, you can see <laughs> but like so entertaining right like I got such a kick off of that entertaining thing whereas yeah and also I couldn't sing so good so like if if it was all about the singing then it's not going to be like oh wow it's beautiful moving it's like this was there a tune did she quite get that whereas with Scar it's like you could kind of screech and it it was part of the character you know so no, oh, I love it. Well, you've only got one song, so you're all good. Yeah. And, so, and it's a yeah. badass song. So I would have <laughs> picked it the song. Alone. Yeah. <laughs> so obviously, we, as we were just talked about, you know, your career started from a young age working on stage. I know you had to drop out of college for reasons we'll discuss in a bit, but was theatre and working on stage the original plan or was it always a stepping stone to want to work on screen? I think I didn't understand very much when I was younger the like film world or the I don't think the connection came with that like acting is also on TV as well I think very naturally when you're young you do plays at school and you're on stages and that's very normal um and then when I got this scholarship at this stage school um I was pushed even further into like the theatre, musical theatre world. And I was just so happy to be there and just wanted to be on stage and perform forever. I think I might have, as I got a bit older, started to think like I should probably come away from musicals because I still couldn't sing even after, I think I did two years of training there. They were on a scholarship and they were still like, yeah, she's great at acting, but I'm not sure about this uh, singing thing. <laughs> It was really awkward when I was voted head girl and it's like the head girl wasn't the girl that was like perfect at everything. I was just very enthusiastic and got on really well with everyone. Um, but they, was, they were kind of like, yeah, the head girl doesn't have a lead role in this production again. And I was like, shit, man, I keep not getting lead roles because I can't dance or sing. Um, but I think, yeah, as time went on, I started to think like maybe I should look at getting into film. But when I was younger, the thought was that you had to go to drama school and then you'd get an agent and then you'd work in film. So there was like a set path that they caught, sort of taught you of, of how to get into it. So it was always like eventually at some point when I'm trained and when I'm ready, then I'll maybe get to be in a movie or something. Um, but I was always like, regardless of that, I just want to be performing and be on stage and just get anything I can until that happens. I don't know what it is about stage and theatre and stuff. There always has to be a song in it. Like, you can't just have a play. You don't have to sing. Just just do a play. <laughs> been in plays since which has got no singing which is obviously why I was in there uh, but there is something magical about when people sing beautifully and it's all you know dancey and shit but it's just not it's just not me I mean I suppose it's good to have it in the back pocket though that sort of that you've gone up and done theatre musical theatre you know regardless of the singing part but you've got that experience in your back pocket so you, you know you're you're multi not ling, but what's the word I'm looking for? Like, like you're multi talents, uh, and you've dipped your toes in each in each sea. No, I wasn't multi talented at all. <laughs> <It wasn't that. laughs> they used to have this terminology called triple threat, and everyone's like, you must be a triple threat, and that meant you were good at singing, acting, and dancing. And they're like, if you want to succeed, you have to be a triple threat, and everyone would go on about it all the time. It was like the bane of my life because so I was like, I'm a single threat. That's it. <laughs> But I will come in here and work so damn hard and be so good at that that I'll get like the pity role because they'll be like, 
this is the role where there's like some really nice acting, but we don't have to get her to like sing or remember any dance moves. Um, but yeah, it's not something I'm still bitter about at all. But I, I think the thing is, is that there's a lot more musicals for kids and there's a lot more musical um, opportunities. And it's kind of like you do the pantomimes and stuff. There, when you're watching kids perform and sometimes they're not very good, the musical parts of it are probably some of the better parts because it's like you can listen to someone sing for a minute or you can watch them try and do some kind of angel dance or something. Um, whereas, obviously, when kids are performing, it's not always very good. So um, I think if you had to watch like an hour play of just acting and it's like, shit, um, people are like not going to enjoy that as much. <laughs> They're going to be like, I don't think we're going to go to this. Like... I don't, I don't I don't know watching 10 year olds who are a bit shit doing Macbeth or something might actually bring some thumbs on seats <laughs> if they're like really bad you have to be like really good or really bad you can't be in the middle when it comes to that mm, <laughs> Shakespeare's never really tickled the old pickle to be fair if I see it I'm like oh cool yeah <laughs> yeah Not I don't for me. think I've ever read a whole Shakespeare play which is like you're not supposed to say that if you're an actor everyone always says like actors are supposed to be like so into it like you're not a proper actor unless you like love Shakespeare but I'm like bullshit yeah I'm not so yeah sure. <laughs> what 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 expect to walk in like can I go and compare thee to a summer's day like <laughs> it's in a brisk Thursday morn I don't know where I was going dost thou want to bequeath like no no let's let's stop doing that now it's 2023 guys right have you not noticed <laughs> we've all moved on but it's like it's like music you can like Shakespeare if you want to like Shakespeare but like if someone's like ramming rap down your throat and you're like not into that like you go like rap's not your thing heavy metal's not your thing whereas with like acting in the acting world it's like if you say like Shakespeare's not my thing it's like you cursed yourself but yeah I don't know maybe as generations go they might allow more of us to publicly say I don't really like Shakespeare <laughs> I don't like shades, but Steven Spielberg on the other hand, come on. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Let's bring it forward a little bit now, yeah. <laughs> so as I said in the previous question then, you, you suffered a major setback. It, it was a back injury, was it? Yeah, yeah. What happened? <laughs> oh, it's like so I was I was working, I used to work from a really young age. I had loads of jobs. I wanted the freedom of having my own money and I liked doing things. So it was probably like my fifth job that I had at this age. And I was just working in a supermarket. Um, and they were very naughty because they didn't do all the health and safety training. And I was like 16 and I was kind ah. of rushed in, rushed onto the shop floor. Um, and the boys in the storeroom used to think it was really funny to get me to do all the hard jobs, like lifting heavy boxes and stuff like that. So they would all sort of stand at the bottom of the ladder while I was trying to lift all these boxes. And me being very tenacious, I was like, yeah, of course I can fucking lift these boxes. Um, not ideal, really. Um, but it was it was like the combination of what I was doing, kind of lifting a wine box out of the shelf and twisting and sort of putting it down and not knowing as a 16 year old girl what to do. Um, and I, yeah, I basically, I damaged the nerves in my spine through what I was doing. Um, and then when I was quite sick for a while and they used to recommend if you had a back injury to lie in bed and not do anything. So I did lie in bed and not do anything. And it got worse because now we've since found out that that's the worst thing you can do for a back injury. Um, and then when I basically went and got, um, I had lots of MRIs and lots of tests and things. And um, they discovered that the reason that the injury had affected me so much was because I have um, chronic degenerative discs in my spine um, ah. and early onset osteoporosis. So essentially the age of my bones was like a 40 year old woman in my spine, despite the fact that I was 16. So that small injury combined with the wrong advice meant that um, I had quite severe like nerve damage around the discs. I had slip discs um, and they were like, you probably won't ever really walk properly again. Um, and you'll probably be in a wheelchair by the time you're 40. 
Um, so it was quite a life changing experience. I don't know if the injury hadn't happened, if I wouldn't have known until later on about my back problems or if it accelerated it or if it caused it, it's really kind of hard to know exactly what that injury did as a whole to everything. Um, but yeah, I still have chronic back pain and I still have the, the nerves in the spine send messages to the brain telling them that there's a much more severe injury than there is. So um, although the, the, the discs and the nerves and stuff are damaged themselves, um, on the surface it's like inflamed and stuff sometimes but there's not really an injury there it's very strange i ended up in uh, st thomas's hospital for a month at their chronic back pain clinic when i was i think 17 or 18 um having treatment on it to try and work out what what was really going on but their kind of whole thing was like you're probably going to be disabled for your whole life um you just probably need to accept that learn how to manage it and stop taking all these painkillers and drugs that you're on because um they're not very good for you um so it wasn't like the best outcome but obviously I was like fuck that I'm like literally <laughs> spent like a year or two like oh my life's over this is the worst thing to ever happen I'm never going to be an actress I'm never going to do anything um and then yeah unexpectedly I got pregnant at 19 and then I was suddenly like fuck man I'm gonna be a mom I've got to actually you know look after another like, human being um and it was out of that experience that I was like, it was that pivotal moment where you kind of make your decision as to what you're going to do. Um, and I was like, well, my life isn't just about me anymore. It's about this child that's coming into the world. So I very much pivoted towards like, what is what can I do to make my back better? And what, you know, what are the, all the different treatment options? What drugs can I stop taking or start taking? Or, um, you know, what, nutrients or something can I find to to help me get better essentially but it was a long yeah a long three years in the middle of all that that is absolutely nuts and I commend you massively for obviously the fact that you're now having a flourishing fantastic career um <laughs> but what a weird way for 16 year olds to flirt <laughs> oh, my, oh I really like you I do can you <laughs> I bet you can't lift that box oh, oh. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> year olds recently that's how 16 year olds flirt i swear they all they're all awkward as fuck that's literally yeah. the whole thing, isn't it it'll be like they're like poke you and be like oh and you're like oh my god yeah sexy you poked me i have like a bruise like thanks bitch <laughs> oh they like shove you over or like punch in the ass and like yeah ah, see that hurt and in the head are going oh my god i really like her i do i like her so much yeah it's so yeah weird. It is, it's, yeah, it's the awkward hormones, isn't it? And I don't know. But I, I see what you're saying, though, in a way of like, have the injury happening, would you have then known about what you, the condition that you have and that sort of thing? It's kind of a, the, the body is mental. It's like the most mentalist thing ever. And like I said before, like, I, it's amazing that you've been able to move past it. You obviously, you had, you've had, you've got your daughter. Were you able to pick her up and carry her and stuff or no? It was actually incredible what happened because your body releases lots of new hormones and lots of new stuff to basically help you after you've had a baby. And one of the things that the body releases, which I used to know what it was called, but I don't really talk about this very much anymore, um, basically helps with elasticity and it basically loosened mm. up my back. And actually, we did have good days and bad days, but I was actually better almost after I had gave birth to her than I was before because <laughs> the body nice. was slowly strengthening over time to carry the weight and I didn't gain much weight but it was slowly strengthening to carry the weight and strengthens around the back and everything so it actually ended up afterwards I was like in so much better than I was before um and that's a big part about what I have to do now is make sure it's all strong and I have to go to the gym to strengthen my back muscles to protect the spine but it was incredible really because like I think she she did save my life actually because I was like a yeah, I like tried to kill myself a few times before I found out I was pregnant because I was so depressed about the whole thing. Um, and then afterwards, I was like, my body is stronger. I've just had a baby and I'm like here to like look after her. And, and that's now my life's purpose. So, you know, 
it helped me physically and mentally and emotionally and also yeah like saved my life so so like lucky that happened yeah i'm so sorry that things got that bad you know and i'm so thankful that you're still here because we wouldn't have this wonderful conversation about princess yeah. coco chanel <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it feels like a different life, though, you know? Like, when you look back at these things, you're like, was that really me? Was that really my life? But it's kind of crazy, these seasons that you go through, and the older you get and the more seasons you go through, the more you can recognise it's a season instead of it being, like, mm. the end of the world. Like, it might be the end of the world as you know it now, but that doesn't mean that your story is finished. It's just another really fucking cool chapter for when you write your book someday. <laughs> I, I was going to ask, like, having the back problem as you're halfway through, as you just started studying to chase you, I, must, I was going to say it must have played hell on your mental health for Justin, but I think you just sort of answered that question, yeah. <laughs> it did. It was so difficult as well because um, I'd worked with, the, um, I've worked with this group doing like an A-level um, standard play. It was theatre, no singing, and I had a lead role. Um <laughs> And I was like sort of being pitted as this like hotshot actress who was going to do really big things as I was going into college. Um, and I was in a bit of a difficult situation because I was obviously dating someone at the time who was a lot older than I was and he wasn't very good for me either. So it felt like I was under attack from quite a few different angles that were not great. But my parents had always kind of taught us, like, when you're under attack, it's because there's something really good happening, like there's something really good coming. Um, and you always feel like it's the darkest day, it's the biggest war when you're on the cusp of doing something great. And that actually is so fucking true, because every time something, like, everything's going to shit in my life, suddenly I'm like, this is why it's going to shit, because it's trying to stop me from doing that thing. And it's like almost like clockwork. So now when something bad happens, I'm like, yeah, something really fucking good can happen. I was going to get through this. And on the other side, it's going to be like really good. So. I love that. I love that. I love the way. You, well, I'm just re It's part of the reason I reached out to you because when I was looking on your website and reading your bio and stuff, I was like, I just love this woman's outlook. Like the way she's gone through things like this is awesome. And yeah, absolutely. It's fantastic. I love that outlook on life. But 2013, I believe it was, you decided to put the acting shoes back on. What was it that made you want to get back into the world? I'd started working in London, doing like promo work, um, and I'd start getting out into the world a bit more. Um, and I started having this feeling of like, okay, I couldn't go to drama school. That didn't quite work out. Um, but what else can I do instead that still means I can be a mum? So... I started picking up um, like essay work, doing like film extras work. Um, and I started to see and understand a different side of the industry that I'd never understood or known before. And then I got introduced into the indie film world as well. And I didn't even know that existed at the time. Um, so it felt like it was kind of, yeah, like the right time for me. I'd had, um, I had a miscarriage um when I was 21 um and I was I had so it's actually mental <laughs> so I had decided I was with this guy he's no good he was really awful to me he used to hit me and he was very abusive oh. um and I decided I saw this advert for this Bollywood film and I was like, I think I'm going to go and try this extras work in Bollywood. So I said to my family, I'm going to go to Oxford and stay in a hostel for two weeks and work on this Bollywood film getting paid 50 quid a day, which is barely going to cover my costs for being there. But I really want to get on a film set and see the world and see what it's really like. And so my parents were always very supportive. They're like, sounds really dangerous take care but go and do it it's fine um <laughs> my boyfriend was like no you can't do that this is like the craziest thing ever um and that was I was I went and did that the director really loved me there was it was a Bollywood film um called uh, Desi Boys with Akshay Kumar 
and I can't say his name, Simon Jamin. Um, but the Bollywood guys, all like when I meet people now who've been in Bollywood and stuff, they're like, oh, Desi Boys. I'm like, yeah, cool, right? Um, but <laughs> I basically went and did that Bollywood film. They were like, come to India, come out. We're going to like make you a movie star. You're really cool. I came back from the shoot and I came home and I said to my dad, like, you know, they love me. I'm going to go be a movie star. Um, and this was actually just before I found out I was pregnant with my daughter, Summer, that I have. So that was obviously back in 2010. Um, and then I was like wearing these like sucking pants on the film set. Like, oh, we have to wear this evening gown. I feel really fat. No idea. I'm wearing three layers of sucking pants because I've got a tiny little baby bump. And I was like six months pregnant. That's why I had this little bump that I thought was just like fat. Um but yeah, the, my boyfriend at the time was like, you can't go off and do this. Like, I don't like this. You shouldn't be doing this. Um, and then obviously I found out I was pregnant with Summer. So I put the whole thing on hold and I was like, no, I'm not doing this. Um, but after, years later, after I had the miscarriage, um, I was like, fuck it. Life is really short. And like, I don't like this guy anyway anymore um I'm just going to kind of go off and do my own thing and just not care so then I was like that film job that I did in 2010 although it wasn't a very good job as a whole that was like film extra work and I was like I'm going to try and do that more so I joined a load of agencies um and yeah sort of started learning from a different perspective because you didn't have all the stuff we have now like in terms of like twitter and stuff it was like we were still buying the stage newspaper to read about what's going on you know back then um so yeah it kind of like launched me into the film extra stuff and then also into um the indie film world and then through the film extra stuff I kind of got this idea that they were like if you can get upgraded and if you can get a bigger role then you can get on spotlight so even if you've not gone to drama school um you can get on spotlight that way so I would be like pushing myself to the front of the film extras like chatting up all the crew like trying to get myself in in like I'd be first in the perfect little film extra everyone's like she's such a suck up I'm like yeah I am because I've got shit to do and I'm not going to go <laughs> off to drama school am I this is this is the only opportunity I've got so and it did work actually because I got a lot of featured parts I got a lot of little lines and stuff um literally just from doing extras work because I couldn't get in the real route where you've studied and you've got your agent and you've got it that way what's the expression it's not about what you know it's about who you know yeah yeah that's brilliant well i mean you were in endeavor you were in eastenders yeah. holby city yeah. uh like you say smashing the independent scene as well but you were also in legend with tom hardy which i think is absolutely amazing and what a film that is but your lines were cut i know it was like one of the biggest like disappointments ever that um i was like this is my big break i've been cast through the ex so so some of the extras agencies basically get to cast smaller roles in the bigger productions because they can save on money so they don't have to get a car to pick you up and they don't have to pay you really high actor rates they can kind of pay you a little add-on to your extras role so it happens quite a lot that you get you can get cast like that so i got cast obviously as the photographer in esmeralda's bar and I was like, this is my big thing. I've got a scene with Tom Hardy. So if nothing else, we'll have a scene and I'm acting alongside him. And I was so excited. And then the filming itself was like really stressful because I had this real 1920s or something camera and the bulbs explode when they go off. Um, mm. And I didn't know at the time, but he's notoriously hates paparazzi. Um, doesn't like going near them and hates flashes in front of his face. So when we're filming our scene and my whole thing is to hold this thing up in front of his face that flashes in his face and he has to do it like 50 times, he fucking hated me. He was like, who the fuck is this bitch? Get out of my face. And I was like, oh, this is like my big break. Um, and then also the fact that like he's very method. So he's like very in character and he's like playing this gangster and he's like wiping snot off his like sleeve and he's like, looking like shit at everyone and he's not like got the suave kind of tom hardy thing that you might kind of expect because he's in character and he's really focused and he's really good um so afterwards i was like okay that wasn't maybe the best experience but 
you know, it was really good fun and obviously I'm going to be in Legend. And then when the movie came out, I just bawled my eyes out because I was like, I just cut all my lines with him. So like this big break that I was supposed to have um, turned into, you can still see a few little screen grabs of me and you can see a few little moments, but it wasn't the acting scene um, that it was meant to be. So, Sorry to bring it up. (laughs) No, it's okay. I've had a few of these, actually. I got hired on Doctor Who to be Pearl Mackey's love interest when they were introducing her. And I was, like, a big fan of Doctor Who back in the day. And I was, like, well, I was a David Tennant fan in that era. And then I did, I did like, go into a little bit the Matt Smith. I dated a guy, well, I kissed a guy once that looked like Matt Smith because I was like, oh, he looks like Matt Smith. This is fun. <laughs> um, but, yeah, like... I wasn't so keen on the Peter Capaldi years, and I think a lot of people kind of killed mm-hmm. off because it, it, you know, when you fall in love with Doctor Who because of um, we did watch a little bit of Christopher Eccleston, but anyway, we started nerding out on Doctor Who. But it was that like, I fell in love in the David Tennant years, so I was like, if I get to be a part of this and not just like a, a little thing, like I get to be like this new assistant's love interest, um, that's like you know a really big part of history part of me was a bit disappointed because i was thinking maybe i won't get to do a bigger role because i've done that although doctor who's notorious for bringing people back later and just pretending that they weren't in it before yeah um but yeah that ended up being a whole shit show in itself because i went off to wales and i was like put up in the hotel and i was like so excited and i got to set and they gave me the script and i looked at the script and the whole premise was Pearl Mackey fancies this girl that works at the university. Okay. So she gives her extra chips. So Sorry, Pearl Mackey works at university, so she's giving her extra chips every day because she fancies her. Okay. And she accidentally fattens her up and now doesn't fancy her anymore. I was like, "Ah." hey, I'm going to do prosthetics or something? Like, I don't know, like never been the skinniest person but I was like okay so we get dressed in costume and we go to set and as soon as I step on set everyone's freaking out and they're like this is not going to work and they're moving the camera around this is not going to work so they send me back to the makeup truck and the costume truck and I get changed and they bring me back again and again they're like and there's always buzzing around me I'm like what have I done wrong um and eventually the first they did took me to one side and he was like we're really sorry but you don't quite look how we were expecting you to look. And I was like, okay. And they're like, we kind of thought that you were going to be kind of like pretty, but a bit fat and a bit chubby. Um, But obviously you're not. (laughs) I was like, okay. (laughs) You've had all my (laughs) side tapes and my photos and things. Um. And they were like, yeah, I mean, you can stick around and we'll still pay you and stuff, but we're going to have to recast you. And I was like, my little heart shattered. And I was like, this is so bad. And I was like, in the film industry, there's a lot of like prejudice against women who are curvier. It's getting better over the years, but normally it's like, you're too fat for this role. So (laughs) when they're like, you're too skinny for this role, I'm like, what the fuck? Like, what kind of like twisted shit is this that I've like travelled all the way up here and I'm like so excited to my big break, my next big break, um, only to be like sent packing. And then actually, when I watched it when it came out, they actually cut that storyline because I was thinking as well, like BBC doing having a storyline like that as well because they didn't tell mm-hmm. me they thought it was going to be my, Pearl Mackey's love interest. They didn't tell me like Pearl Mackey's fat love interest that she accidentally fattens up like. I wouldn't have been up for that anyway. Um, but yeah, obviously they didn't give you the script till you got there. So that yeah, was a whole shit show in itself. But I did watch it thinking. And the worst thing is they still shot it, but one of the runners called their friend and was like, hi, and we have this role that we need to fill. Would you mind like coming up and playing this character? So they'd said to all the crew, like, has anyone of you got like a fat but pretty friend you can ring? And I was like, that's not Ugh. BBC that we all know and talk about. It. That's but not obviously good. At some point looked at the script when they got to this, you know, edit or whatever and went, that's not very nice. Maybe we won't run that storyline. And now you can see a girl walk up with a tray, 
Pearl puts some chips on her tray and she walks off. And that that is the role that I was supposed to play that they cut out because they realised it was fucking toxic. <laughs> yeah. Wow. I, I can say to people, fuck those guys. Yeah. <laughs> fuck those guys in the asshole is all I can say on that. Like, no like, lube. Couldn't they have changed the role just to be like still Pearl Mackey's love interest, but like drop the fat, chips joke oh. but i don't know it wasn't meant to be i'm i'm holding out that there's a bigger role for me in doctor who someday and i love them so if you hear this don't be mad at me but <laughs> i think it's important that we talk about these things and the mistakes that companies make even if it's not really you know at the time things were a bit different but i do think it's we shouldn't put them on the pedestal and say i'm never going to say that the that they did that because if I do they might not hire me I think that we can say they made a mistake it wasn't great but hopefully they've learned from that and they'll do better in future and hopefully I'll still get to work with them at some point on it because I still yeah still a big Doctor Who fan although I don't really watch it anymore it was like the the David Tennant years I go back and watch like the spinning Christmas tree episode with Billy Piper <laughs> Although I'm, I'm intrigued on the new one I'm, I'm going to give it a watch I... Yes, no, definitely. I will give yeah. it a watch. But... I'm intrigued. In there. No, there was something about the old writing that was really creepy as well, like the weeping angels and stuff that was like, you know, really interesting and like psychologically. Maybe because I was younger as well, it was scarier. But... <laughs> no, to be fair, the weeping angels are creepy as hell. Yeah, and the gas masks. Mummy. <laughs> are you my mummy? <laughs> <laughs> so in 2017, I believe it was, you decided so acting is not enough for me. And you started Faithful Films. What led you to decide to start your own production company, start making your own films? Well, I was getting all these love interest roles and that's all well and good. But I mean, they're boring as fuck, aren't they? Um, <laughs> <laughs> so I met with the director um, and he was saying, I'd really love to make a film with you, but I don't have anything coming up that would work for you. Um and, I, and he said, there is this one thing, but I don't have time to produce it. I don't have time to make it at the moment. Um, and it's on an aeroplane and I probably can't get hold of an aeroplane. And this is just me all over. I was like, I could probably get hold of an aeroplane. I could probably produce, never having done it before. Like, why not? <laughs> so, <laughs> um, I just ran with it. I read the script. It was really, it's a little short film called In Flight. You can actually watch it on Amazon. Um, it was really fun and kooky. And I basically self-taught myself how to do it um and my dad was in the aviation industry so he was working for a company so we were going to use the plane from his work um where they would have planes coming through that were being decommissioned um but that fell through at the last minute because um they decided they wanted loads the the air the the airfield themselves decided they wanted loads of money from us at the last minute so i was like okay i can still find a plane like tenacious faith um and i found out that there was one that was used for the filming of sully the documentary and they basically submerged it underwater for the filming and now it's at black hanger studios so it's a bit ropey looking and it's not in perfect condition but i managed to sweet talk them into lending to it to us for like a few hundred quid for the day and then i was like so we're going to film this whole movie in a day on this airplane um and yeah, we managed to do we managed to do that. So I thought coming out of that, I was like, you know, this should be it was a joint Faithful Films production um, with the director's production company. Um, and yeah, like it was hard work. Like, Jesus Christ, I was up the night before making fucking pasta because obviously we had like no money. So we had like loads of extras coming that needed feeding. So me and my oh. sister were like cooking pasta there's nothing weird with pasta that happens in the movie so. oh i was gonna say i was just like what's that for <laughs> ah, we a pasta bar <laughs> no but it's all the um when you have no money on a movie it's all these small things that you don't realize that like take up so much time that someone has to do and if you can't pay someone to do it then you're just stuck in your kitchen at 3 a.m making fucking pasta like you just have to do what you have to do to get it done you know um, but it went really well and people really enjoyed it. And then after that, I was thinking, if I produce more movies that I want to be in, I have more control over the sort of roles I want to play. Although she was a love interest as well, but she was like a feisty love interest who was kind of like 
biting back at this like sleazy businessman that was hitting on her on the plane um and then she kind of turns into a little bit of a psychopath near the end which is really fun and it's like got this like she's kind of a werewolf so there's all these like werewolf jokes in it as well so it was like it wasn't just like oh look at me aren't i pretty with my great tits yeah let's go and fall in love shall we it's like the opposite of that it's like yeah all right you're like hitting on me and you won't leave me alone fine i'm gonna like fuck with you and like put you in your place so yeah those kind of love interest roles interest me more <laughs> <laughs> Just, I was looking at faithful films, and one that stood out to me, which I believe is one of your first films, The Whisperings. Yes, yeah. So you wrote it, you starred in it, you produced it, you shot it on land, sea, the sky, six different cameras, two drones, two underwater yeah. cameras, and you thought this would be one of your first projects. Was it Go Big, Go Home? What the hell? <laughs> uh, well, it was an accident, right? It was one of these <laughs> stupid fucking accidents where... I went to this film competition thinking I would be an actor in someone's film. And it was like a, I don't know, you had two weeks or something to make a movie. And so I went there and I had a team and we were all like excited and we were bouncing ideas around. And slowly, one by one, all my teammates started dropping out. And I was like, no, I want to make a movie. Like, I really want to do this. And so it ended up with just me and one other person left on the project so I was like well fuck it let let's just do it anyway so yeah it's actually um kind of like a fantasy kind of thing about this girl who's a mermaid and she I don't know it's kind of sound lame when you talk about it now but basically when you sit on the beach and you feel better the reason that you feel better is because the rocks are taking on your feelings essentially so they're kind of taking away the pain and the suffering that you're feeling um but obviously the rocks can't do that in indefinitely infinitely so the the role of these kind of mermaid creatures is to come out and relieve the suffering of the rocks and then they take the suffering into the sea and it kind of goes out into the water so um it was this like beautiful ethereal kind of fantasy thing um where she's coming out on the rocks and she's kind of treating the rocks and stroking them um <laughs> and then Sky sees her and he's like what are you doing why are you stroking the rocks you're a fucking weirdo um <laughs> and then she gets offended she's like excuse me this is my job um and like decides to drag him out to sea and drown him as you do when men offend you so she um kind of lures him out to sea in this kind of like siren like thing um and yeah we we shot underwater we borrowed a local swimming pool it actually looked really cool we had like really dangerously just like little lights in lunch boxes floating on the surface of the water um i can't really hold my nose underwater very well so i spent a week in the bath trying to learn how to hold the water under nose which really pissed off the underwater photographer because i could only get underwater for about 30 seconds max at a time none of this avatar seven minute bullshit uh, and i was very buoyant and i didn't know at the time how to go down and it was a very shallow pool um so i'd kind of get down and then very quickly come back up again so it was very it was very tricky um but yeah, we got through it. This was early days of drones as well. And I knew a guy who had a drone and we shot like these sweeping shots across Brighton of like the West Pier. And we nearly got arrested because there was some kind of like royal visit the next day. And they thought that we had the drones because we were like trying to, <laughs> no, I don't want to say it out loud, but do some kind of terrorist attack, I guess. Um, we were like, no, we got permission and everything. Like we, I'd insured it all properly. Um, but yeah that was adventurous and also newbie filmmaker faith oh if we're if we're shooting nighttime we shoot at night right why don't we just go to brighton beach in november at like 10 o'clock at night and i'll be half dressed and we'll just shoot on the beach because then it will look like night and it'll be nighttime that seems like a really reasonable thing to do until like 2 a.m in the morning <laughs> so yeah I was like doing things how I thought that things should be done in my own knowledge and capacity and then bringing people around me who are willing to just kind of believe in me and just be like, why not? Let's see what happens. 
Um, I even slept in my mermaid makeup because we had to do a shot the next day and we couldn't get the makeup artist back again the next day. And it was like scales on my face and we'd use fishnets and you'd never get, well, you would get it in continuity if you were Avatar, but we couldn't. So I was like in my prosthetics asleep, trying to like not move. So it stayed on for the next day. Um, but you know, like filmmaking is like the biggest buzz and it's like almost like the more ridiculous and the harder it is, the bigger kick you get when you pull it off and when you're early days you don't understand what you're doing like you you as in like you don't understand how hard and ridiculous what you're trying to do is you're like why not let's just let's just do it and then as you get further into the industry you're like wow I probably wouldn't shoot a whole short film on an airplane in one day again or I probably wouldn't shoot a mermaid film it's like my first project like managing all these things and then everyone that I know is like credited like my dad's credited as location manager on it because he was like driving us all around and I think my mum was credited as uh, costume alterations because she was like sewing up my dress so when you read the credits their surname's Downey it's like Ian Downey Heather Downey Grace Downey it's like yeah I really did get everyone I know to just kind of (laughs) help that's amazing I mean that is dedication to the cause right there when you're starting out not you know with all that makeup on not moving going to Brighton Beach at 2 a.m in not a lot is <laughs> dedication to the cause but let me so don't piss you off because you'll, you'll drown us so to remember that yep. um <laughs> and also the terrorist attack thing with the roars are attending if it was prince andrew he you didn't he'd shit himself but you wouldn't know he doesn't perspire so you know <laughs> so you know what can you say um i mean i think that's ridiculous that they thought that though to be honest with you i think i just killed jamie he'll he'll be a minute um <laughs> I think that's absolutely mental that it's like, I don't know what you're here for. You're here for the rules, aren't you? I'd no. <laughs> like sometimes people do things gorilla where they just kind of don't really get the proper permissions and they hope for the best. But then you could be like, we'll just shoot on Brighton seafront this on this day, and then you don't realise there's a marathon or something, or you know, <laughs> we'll just shoot at the because it was the I three sixty that they were visiting and we were shooting at the West Pier, which is owned by a different company. So we had to notify the West oh, Pier, yeah. but we didn't have to notify the I three sixty because we weren't flying over the I three sixty. But then the I three sixty were like, Why do you it was again in the days before drones were a really big thing as well. It was like, why do you have a drone flying when we have Royals coming today? And we were like, um, no reason. Definitely <laughs> just filming me walking across the beach, not like whoever you've got visiting. So, yeah, luckily we got away with it, though. So, and Especially on small indie films like this, things like that can kill your film. Like, if you get arrested or if your drone gets confiscated or something, you know, that can kill a whole project and it can make a lot of people give up. So I think people that actually go on to make another film, you know have got probably some pretty severe mental health issues to put themselves through that again after knowing what it's going to do to them the first time. <laughs> you can ruin your production. Do you enjoy oh. torture? Do you enjoy being miserable? Do you enjoy everything going wrong all the time? Yeah, I do, because then I get this movie. <laughs> Give me more. Give me more. More it! I was going to say, um, those, those things kind of ruin a project or they could be great stories on podcasts in the future. So, yeah. And later, like you still screen it. They still screen the whisperings every so often on their channel. So that's amazing. It's <laughs> awesome. You um you studied screen combat at one point before starting your uh, your company uh, with the British Action Academy and completed the first phase and then didn't continue because you thought that the bruising and the whatnot would not get you roles in the future. Wh- why? You should have carried on. You could have been kicking some serious ass at the same time as acting. Well, the first thing is, I still have pretty severe back issues, so I don't know what the fuck. Oh, that's a good point. Yeah. In the first place, I was like, if I if I train in stunts and stuff, I'll be more higher. So they, they teach actors, you make yourself more hireable, get skills, do things. So I was like, oh, that'll be fun. And the first phase seemed pretty low key and pretty easy. So I was like, you know, that'll be really good fun. And then when I turned up and I was getting these pretty heavy swords, like actually hitting you sometimes and then I had all these massive bruises and then like I fell over a couple of times like on the floor and I was like ow and I was like you know if you like skateboard and you like fall over and you think ow I'd like to go home like skateboarding is probably not for you (laughs) well (laughs) it was the same thing I was like no this hurts and 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 one of the things they taught us as well was 
you are replaceable. So you have to make sure that you do everything in your power to stay as safe as possible. Because if you get injured, they're just going to bring somebody else in to replace you tomorrow because you can't tell who it is anyway. And I was like, oh, shit. I don't know if I want to be, like, doing some kind of skill that, like, makes me replaceable. Like, I'm like, I want to be the person that they bring in that they're like, no, this is the precious one that we can't injure. <laughs> not like, ah, oh, fuck it, she's hurt herself again. Oh, I'll get another one in. Like, that's not my vibe. Like, <laughs> but, yeah, I don't know what I was thinking with that. Like, it wasn't, it wasn't great. But I did meet some really awesome guys, and I met a lot of people that have gone on, and they work on the stunt register now, and they get to be in really cool stuff like Wonder Woman and all this kind of stuff. Um, and I'm really happy for them. And, like, I do look at them, and I think I would, I was never going to be that person, you know? Like, they went and did gymnastics and all this stuff. And I'm like, I could do it to like a very basic level, maybe. I mean, not gymnastics, fuck. But like, maybe I could do like something. I looked at the falling course. We have to like fall out a building. And I was like, maybe I could do like one or two falls. And I'm like, are you dumb? Like, then I went to like walk for a week afterwards because like my, ah, oh, my old back hurts. <laughs> like, yeah. At least you tried it, I suppose. At least it's something, you know, you complete the first phase. At least it's got that under you. Has it ever come in? Have you ever needed it? Um, I did actually do a couple of, like, things where I got hired as, like, you know, a girl with a gun and stuff afterwards. Um, but not very... The thing is, like, all the actors are trying to be so versatile and they're trying to be everything and they're, like, trying to be like, oh, yeah, I can do this and I can ride a horse and I can do this. And I'm like very much the sort of person that's like, if you want a girl who can ride a horse, I I know who you can hire. I don't need to do that. That's not me. I'm not trying to be everything to everyone. Um, And yeah, I think that it's more important actually to work out what you are and what you're good at. And that doesn't mean that sometimes you might not want to do a bit of fun and, and learn how to be a fucking mermaid. But that doesn't mean that like you need to think that you need to be everything to everyone. So. I like that. You know, you don't need to be a jack of all trades. You can just be really fucking good at what you do. <laughs> yeah, I, think so. I really believe that. Like, I think if more people kind of focused on working out who they are and what they're good at and what their kind of route is, they would stop trying to spread themselves too thinly across lots of different things. And also they would stop feeling disappointed when they don't get, you know, this particular role because like, that's not, that wasn't for you because you're not the best person to play Tomb Raider type role or, you know, whatever role it is. Like you were never that person to do that. Um, And then when a role comes along that you think I am the person to do that, that's when you can like grab it by the horns and be like, no, this is what I'm, you know, this is what I've trained for. (laughs) <laughs> absolutely i get that so talking about faithful films obviously you know how do you go about acquiring these films to make them because i know you write some of them yourself but there are ones written by other people do you do people approach you or do you go out hunting scripts how does that process work i think it's a mixture like i don't take scripts from random people who send them to me although they keep sending them to me anyway um it's more Any great ones which ones have you had I don't, I don't open them. I don't read them. I'm not interested. Oh. It's a whole thing to sit down and read a script as well. And you get this thing where someone messages you like, hi, I need a producer. Here's my script. I'm like, that's like walking on a dating site. I mean, like, hi, I'm a man. I need a woman. Here's my dick. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> No, it's not. Oh, would you like it? No, let's get to know the whole I thing. don't. I've never understood that. I've never, ever. I don't think anybody has ever attained a wife or a girlfriend by going, hi, nice to meet you. Here's my penis. Yeah. It's shocking, really, isn't it? Like that people I don't get it. I think it's an ego thing, actually. I think people like the fact that they've shown it to someone and that they know that they've seen it. I think that's why they do it, but they're just deluded disgusting yeah anyway. yep agreed um, anyway sorry carry on uh, <laughs> go from there to there what uh, just happened <laughs> so 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 all the projects i've worked on normally are people that i know that have said to me i'm trying to make this project i need help in this particular way can you do it are you around to do it are you interested in doing it and they already have a relationship with me so it's the relationship that comes first and it's the 
I kind of understand who you are and what you're trying to do. And then I can sort of see if I want to get on board because any film you work on takes years of your life mm. and it's really difficult and it's really stressful. Um, so even if you got sent a really good script by someone, you've got no idea what the writer director team is or if you're doing all the work from the ground up it's a huge amount to do that the way that I prefer to do it is like what am I getting out of it is it because I'm going to do an acting role in this thing is it because I'm going to learn a skill is it because it's really well paid and it's a short gig so I can just do it quickly and get out you know what what is the situation and and how is it going to progress my career forwards um and is it in line you know, our, the, the slate of films we have on Faithful Films is quite different. Um, and I'm sort of more deciding now about making films that obviously, since I started directing, it's more about what I'm really passionate, excited about and what I'm trying to do with my career as a whole. Um, but I do get asked to come on as producing on other projects as well. Um, but it's it's very difficult because it is like saying, would you like to give me two years of your life? Um, and if you start going down the route with someone and then you're finding it really stressful or you don't care about the project, then, you know, you don't want to be that person that is leaving them in the lurch. So you have to think about it because it's all very exciting when someone says, do you want to work on my movie? Yeah, let's go make a movie. How much work? How much am I getting paid? <laughs> like, you know, it's a whole thing. Um, it's not like when you're acting and you can come in and do a couple of days on something and then leave. Or even if you come in and do a, a large part of the project, you're still acting. Um it's a smaller responsibility than when you're producing and everything I do, I want to do as good as I can. And I want to push the limits and I don't want to be like, Oh, this is within our skill set. I'm like, so we're going to do this. <laughs> like this is within our budget. We're going to do this. Like that's <laughs> what excites me. Not like what is a normal, reasonable thing. Like, Oh, we'll shoot a film in a cafe over a week. Like, Oh, oh it's boring. Like, I don't want to do that. Where's the airplane? Go cool. Yeah, exactly. Like, where's like the really cool, crazy stuff that's like going to get my blood pumping, and then when we achieve it, it's going to be like really cool. So, what do you prefer to that of interest, acting or the behind the scenes thing? Because you seem to be loving both. I do love both. Yeah, I think it depends on the project. Um, I just want to do everything all the time. <laughs> I think acting is a particular type of thing, but. The thing is with acting is that there's so many people trying to get the roles and it's such a big thing. Like I'm not interested in doing tons of self tapes. Like the normal actor has to apply for lots of roles, spend a lot of time on spotlight or with their agent or going into London. I mean, now we do more zooms, but I'm not interested in wasting half my life casting for things that I'm probably not right for. I'm much more interested in when someone approaches me and says, we've got something we think it might work for you that I then look at that because then I'm maybe competing against five people and the time I put in is more valuable. Um, they say that, I don't know what they say, like 90% of the time actors are not working. They're just casting and like doing self tapes and stuff. Mm. And I'm like, it's a waste of my life. <laughs> like I don't want to learn lines and try and, you know, look into your product and look into your production company and look into what you're doing and all that kind of stuff. But then you to like, you know, look at my picture and be like, nah, too tall you know because that's what it is a lot of the time and since I've worked on the other side I appreciate it as well but you can have a vision in your mind it doesn't mean that person's not good but they're not the vision you have in your mind so then they could have agonized <coughs> over it and they get rejected and then you feel shit afterwards and it was never anything to do with you it was just because you didn't fit exactly what they were looking for um so in terms of like having sort of agency and control over what I do I prefer the sort of directing and producing side because you can decide more about what's going on whereas when you're an actor you're very vulnerable and you're kind of in their hands all the time um and the actors don't get to act often enough like it's not fair <laughs> like, even if you're doing like you know weekly rehearsals or something or weekly classes it's not the same as getting to go on mm. set is casting too specific sometimes, though? Can people be really overly specific about it for no fucking reason whatsoever? Yeah, it's really strange, actually. Either end of the spectrum is weird. Like, we'll see everyone between the age of 20 and 60, every weight, every colour, every size, every this, every that. And then I think, okay, they don't know what they're doing. 
so <laughs> it feels like they're just like throwing out a net and just don't really know what they really want but then sometimes it's very specific um and it you kind of look at it and you think why is it so specific because if it's specific for a reason like they have to be 16 because they're at school fine um or if it's very specific like they have to be very skinny because they're anorexic fine but a lot of the time i see a lot of it is like 18 to 25 blonde under five foot seven size six to eight that's like a very standard casting (laughs) and it's because they're they've got this image in their mind of like young pretty hot girl and you're like is that necessary for like a police officer or is that necessary for like (laughs) (laughs) for this particular character um and it's often not it's just like you know the director maybe has the idea in their head that you know for a long time all police officers were men and you know all nurses were women and it's taken a long time to be like you can have a male nurse um and that's good and also you can have a nurse that's older like you don't have to have a nurse that's like 30 you can have a nurse that's just qualified as long as it doesn't affect the storyline but you can have a nurse that's been a nurse for a long time and no they haven't progressed to be a doctor because being a nurse and being a doctor are different things so not everyone wants to be a doctor they want to be a nurse so you can have a 60 year old male nurse and that is fine and no he doesn't need to be ripped with a six pack because he's a nurse (laughs) like or Maybe he gets to be ripped with a six pack. Um, You know, you don't always need mummy roles to be grumpy middle-aged women. But at the same time, we often don't get that unless the reason that the mummy role is a frumpy middle-aged woman is because her husband doesn't love her anymore because he thinks she's ugly. And I'm like, oh, God, it's not, you know, there's still a lot of like stereotyping that goes on that's quite toxic. Um. I think what's more hurtful is actually a lot of the time you can still be a very skinny, fit, attractive, whatever woman, um, and your partner can go off you anyway because it's it wasn't that that caused the separation in your relationship. Um, but we are seeing more diversity now on screen. Um, it still takes a long time to filter through. Even with like female roles as well, there's a lot of um, diversity that's happening. But then I've been hearing that still some of the biggest studios are saying to friends of mine, you know, we don't really want too many women in this film. There's, there's like, it is a strong female role, but we also need a male role who's strong as well because it can't be too female-led. And I'm like, but women will watch it, and that's 50% of the population. <laughs> so, you know, these executives are all still very male-dominated at the top. So they're thinking, I want to see tits and guns. And it's like... Well, you know, it's a period drama about... Because <laughs> <laughs> I can't say I've watched a TV series and gone, oh, my God, they've cast that back to incorrectly. It should be 37 and Iranian. What's this all about? You know, I watch a TV show for, for stories. I, You know, it's... I Yeah, you want, you want to be able to associate with the character or whatever, but... I've never really looked at them and gone, oh, my God, why is Bendit Cumberbatch not in this? Yeah. You know, because it, it's called The Midwife, Tom, that's why. Yeah, I don't give a shit. <laughs> why is Bendit Cumberbatch not in it? it yeah. It, yeah. It this weird, there's this weird thing where they want you to know your audience and they want you to know your niche, but at the same time, the men with the money want it to appeal to everyone. And you can't be, you know, Slipknot, who has a huge audience, and still appeal to Mozart fans by, like... <laughs> Having a bit of Mozart. Great. You can't like both, but you don't go out there like we're going to make sure that Slipknot is Mozart audience appropriate. Like that's not. Oh my like, god! I want to hear Slipknot. that now. Like let it be what it is, and let the people that like that come to it without shoehorning something else in to expand the audience, and let creators create. You know, they're saying a lot of the films coming through at the moment don't feel as good, and you don't realize how much micro managing is going on so a great director gets given a big disney project and you're like yeah they're gonna do a great job and then you watch it and you're like oh it's all right and it's because they've been so micromanaged up to their eyeballs that they haven't been able to do what they wanted to do with it and then everyone blames the director and you're like well 
was it not the 50 middlemen stood behind them that are on every single project that goes through the doors that went, we want more of this and more of this. And they were like, okay, like it's, it's, yeah. it's still difficult to, um, yeah, to, to get the money and the creativity freedom at the same time. Yeah. I can't imagine someone's there going, I, I enjoyed Pocahontas, not enough boobs for me. Yeah. <laughs> Like that's not what the story's about. I don't care, Dave. I I wanted more. I wanted more cleavage in that film. Why? <laughs> be like, so I was really thinking we could have some, you know, airplanes in this, but they didn't have airplanes. Yeah, but you know, airplanes is very popular. Do you see the Top Gun movie? Everyone liked that. So could we put some airplanes in this? You're like, no. Let it be its new own thing. That's great. Yeah. What a great part. Not like. <laughs> Pocahontas, like, oh, look at that great a Airbus A360 flying over. <laughs> <laughs> John Smith swoops down on the wing of a plane to save the day. <laughs> I and really enjoyed like, Cinderella. Not enough Tom Cruise. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Not enough Tom Cruise. He's he makes lots of money on movies. Why is Tom Cruise not in this movie? Yeah, <laughs> just... <laughs> we're making. I'd love to get inside some of their heads and be like, I just want to know what you think. Like, why why you think this is appropriate and why you need need I, this? I think it's because money in movies is it's really hard to know what's going to sell. It's really hard to know. Let my dogs come say hello. It's really hard to know. Yes, she no, is. No, no licky faces. Coco. <laughs> yeah. You say hello. Yes, I know. Very. Coco. She's so. Uh... <laughs> um, I mother, think... I'm excited. Well, sit down then. Mummy's on a work call. Sit down. <laughs> <laughs> I, think, I think it's because you don't know what's going to make money and everyone's so worried that the film's not going to make any money and most films don't make money and I think that's the problem. And so they're trying to guess what the thing is that's going to mean that they're going to make money and they don't really know. And so they just try and do what you do in most businesses, which is, you know, we look at the business model from what we did last time and we try and replicate that in order to have another successful product um but movies are art they're not you know something that you can manufacture and churn out again no matter how many sequels of fast and the furious we're going to get which, oh don't even you know that is a model that works for them maybe to do 10 now but that's not a model that's going to work for everything um and yeah, it's it's difficult though because you know a lot of movies do do lose money, so you can't completely ignore the statistics on it. Because if movies only lost money, we would struggle to make movies. So absolutely, I think that's why indie cinema is a winner because you haven't got studios going money, 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 money. The director, the writer, they can have their vision, they can do what they want with it, and they don't have that big wig go. No, this needs Tom Cruise. You know? Yeah, exactly. But then it's very difficult to get money in indie cinema and it's very difficult to make money in indie cinema as well. Yeah. So, you know, it's it means that creatively people can do better, but then they watch it and go, God, if I hadn't had to stay, and stay up all night making pasta for the crew, maybe we would have had a better movie. Or, you know, if we'd had a little bit more budget and we could have afforded, like, real special effects instead of, some kind of play-doh stuck to his face um we would have made a more convincing lincoln or whatever <laughs> but it it's it's difficult i think both ends yeah. um, need to find that middle ground somewhere in the ether wherever the fuck it might be <laughs> uh, yeah <laughs> So the current project you're promoting, My Baby Cries, seems to be a real passion project of yours. What's the film about? So the film is about a couple who are struggling to um, communicate. And spoiler alert, um, it it basically you think it's a, a story about postnatal depression because they've recently had a baby and then later on it's revealed that they actually the baby actually died um and the mother's been carrying around a doll that she's been seeking comfort from in order to process the grief of losing the child um and that comes from the fact that when i had my miscarriage my daughter had this baby doll 
and um when I went for the scan they said to me oh the baby has died and I was like no it hasn't <laughs> so I left and I carried this doll around for a week before I went for the second scan to find out if the baby had died or not because you can tell if you take them a week apart for sure um and I got a lot of comfort from cuddling this doll which was almost strange because I actually had a child who was like two or something as well so it's not like I couldn't cuddle my child but there was something about this little doll it had a weight to it um and it was really quite emotionally moving the fact that it it didn't it wasn't a, a plasticky one it was it was my child's doll but it it felt a lot like a baby mm. um and the feeling that I got from carrying it around obviously gave me a lot of comfort then when I found out the baby had actually died, I found it very difficult to put the doll down, but I did. But it was always symbolic as well of like, okay, the baby has died. I do need to like say goodbye and let that go. Um, and the story follows Abe, the husband, as he's trying to console her and trying to almost say live a normal life, but trying to make her happy and do what he can to sort of help her while he knows that she's um, suffering with depression. But he also knows that she's been carrying around this doll and she's been hiding it from him. And he then hears from a friend at the park that they've seen her pushing the doll in the park, like pushing the pram in the park with the doll in it. So he realises, you know, she's still struggling. Um, and he comes home and tries to talk to her about it and she doesn't want to talk to him about it and then um she goes upstairs upset and he goes in the nursery and she's sat there cuddling the doll and they have an argument basically where it all sort of everything sort of spills out um it's quite a dark sad <laughs> film um but it talks to the sort of grief and the lost feeling and it also talks to not demonizing either person and not saying that it's the father's fault or the mother's fault it's just a difficult stressful situation that they're both in and neither of them really know how to handle it um and that was important that we sort of didn't sort of say the dad has done something wrong that it was actually just about um yeah the two of them sort of working out what to do about the situation that they're in fuck that is so deep but <laughs> I think it's really important you tell stories like these, though. And that is one of the beauties of indie cinema, because there are people out there, like yourself, as you said, that are struggling. And, you know, some, for some people, to see it represented can help you go, I'm not alone. Yeah. Other people go through this. This is not just me. I can get through this. They got through it. I can get through this. And it's comforting. And it's amazing that, you know, you've put your skill, your talent, and, you know, your own experiences into doing this. I think it's absolutely beautiful. I really do. Oh, thank you. It's We've screened at a lot of festivals and every festival we screen it at, people come up to me afterwards and they there's always so many people who have their own story, if it's themselves or if it's someone that they know that have been through something where they've lost a child. Um, it's something that affects so many people and yet we don't talk about it very much and it's never... It's very rarely portrayed in cinema. If it is, it's not always done very well. Um, and it's a difficult, taboo subject. I mean, they're talking about how do we get people in cinemas and bums on seats and make money. And it's a hard sell to be like, so we're going to make a movie about someone whose baby has died. Everyone's like, that sounds horrendous. <laughs> like, I don't want to go and sit and spend my Friday night doing that, watching that. Um, but actually... The reality is is that people do want those stories to be told and they do want people to be brave enough to have those conversations and it opens up conversations that people can have where they sometimes haven't spoken about it or they felt like they couldn't talk about it or they felt like they're quite alone in it. Um, and what's interesting to me is that, although I had my miscarriage when I was 21, the reason that we made the film was because my sister and my best friend both miscarried and in the same week and oh. it was so traumatizing and the same feelings that I had 10 years before they were having and the same grief 
and difficulties with knowing what to say and difficulties knowing how to handle it were being mirrored 10 years later. It wasn't that we'd really progressed as a society, that we'd really learned a lot, that we talked about it a lot. Um, and it, I just realised how common it was as well. And I just thought, like, it's a difficult thing to do, but it's a really, really important thing to do. And I don't want us in another 10 years to be in a similar situation again where nothing has really progressed. And pe unfortunately, babies are always going to die. It's one of the greatest tragedies that can happen. But hopefully we can learn as a society to talk about it more, that we can lift some of the taboos and that we can find a connection in that grief that that will get stronger over the years the more that we're able to sort of deal with the trauma of it and talk about the trauma of it um yeah it's a heavy <laughs> film but i think it's a necessary film absolutely and it seems to be winning awards at all these different festivals yeah. is there plans for a wider release yeah so um I want to so so once the festival run is finished, which is really soon, um, then we're going to release it publicly. I'm looking at the different VOD channels as to where we're going to put it, um, but I want it to be accessible to wide audiences without it costing loads of money because it was never a film that was meant to make money, as such. Mm. So um, I'm not interested so much in paywalling it and protecting it like that i'm much more interested in being able to put it on platforms where people can reach it and where hopefully people can watch it um and it can make a difference so we're working with mama academy who are um a miscarriage um charity miscarriage and baby loss charity that's run by parents who've mostly had stillborn stillborn child children um and we hope to put it out on their platforms as well and sort of just kind of reach those places with it and then my plan is to make, I, and I've got another film that I'm planning to make um, called Bunny, which explores similar themes and it explores similar story, but hopefully with a slightly more commercial side to it so that we can give it the voice and put it on a platform in a way that means that mm. we can reach more people. Um, and that's going to be exploring the mechanics and the bit that films often skip as well, where if you've seen a film where they talk about baby loss, which is only a handful of them, but the baby, they find out the baby has died and then we skip to six months later. That's always the thing. It's like yeah. six months later, we then skip to how has it affected them now they're an alcoholic having an affair, whatever. Um, but the hardest days when you have a miscarriage or lose a baby like that are the days immediately after and the mechanics of dealing with it, because nobody really talks about the physical side of what you have to go through um, and the the telling people that don't know yet. And, you know, you still have a bump and you have to talk to people in the street who ask you how far gone you are. And you're like, well, my baby's actually dead. So <laughs> it's like all of that kind of stuff that we want to explore in that film um, that hopefully we can also bring in some terminology that helps people learn how to talk to people when this happens and also kind of shows you like um a very well-meaning people say things like oh i'm sure you can try again and you're like oh great <laughs> like that doesn't make it better but if we put that on screen and people watch that hopefully then they'll watch that and think that was a dumb thing to say and hopefully then you know people will learn from that and think i won't say that when that if that happens to someone that I know. Um, so that's kind of the plan with the journey of the, My Baby Cries, because My Baby Cries is just, it's very dark and it's very sad and it it intentionally doesn't have a resolution. It doesn't have a, they lived happily ever after, they had another baby, anything like that. It just, it 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 is just very singular in its message. Um, but when we hopefully do Lost Bunny, then, yeah, we hope to explore more of those kinds of things I, th I think it's amazing and it's really amicable that you know you're willing to do this to help people and to help at the end of the day help strangers you don't know these people yeah and you're willing to put yourself out there and your time and your effort to help them is absolutely mind-blowing you know a tip if i had a hat i'd tip it you know it's oh, thank you sir <laughs> but 
you know, this isn't the first thing you've done to help other people. As I mentioned in the beginning, you've got your Yes She Can campaign. Yeah. What What is the campaign? So um, it sort of came, so I, I was going to Cannes Film Festival, um, as you do. As you do. Um, <laughs> and I absolutely love it. I think it's an amazing place where people can meet and connect and widen their networks. They can learn so much. Um, obviously, I got to watch the BFG with Steven Spielberg and I was on the front row and he was five rows behind me. And I was like, this is cinema. We're in a 2,000 person cinema screen watching the real world premiere. So it's like magical and beautiful and amazing and all these things. But off the back of the Me Too movement, a lot of stories were coming out about bad things that were happening at Cannes and there was a lot of bad things that are happening and there are still sadly bad things that happen at the festival but the amount of press around it had people that I know saying to me don't you think you shouldn't go to the festival because it's dangerous or don't you think that women need to avoid the festival and it was as a result of something that we really needed to talk about the difficult things and to stop the, the bad things that were happening there was so much negative press around the festival that women didn't want to go. And there was a negative vibe around women wanting to attend. And I was like, oh, that's not what we need. Like less women at the festival because of this. Um, so I started it to basically encourage more women to attend. And then also to show people the type of women who are attending so that they can hopefully see themselves or see a future themselves in those people so that they think it's not just about A-list Hollywood actors attending, but, you know, this sales agent or this producer or so-and-so is there and that hopefully that encourages them to attend as well because they can see more relatable role models and more relatable inspiring figures that are attending. And then also we sort of promote women who are attending as well. So we run our She Squad on Instagram and social media, um, Twitter and Facebook, which basically ahead of the festival sort of shows a little snippet of people who are attending. Um, and again, they can then connect beforehand if they want, or it gives the people who are attending themselves an opportunity to boast a little bit, to say, look, here's my little profile, I'm going to Cannes. Um, and it gives them permission to celebrate themselves and to have other people you know, look at their achievements because sometimes women don't talk very much about their own achievements and they feel a bit awkward about it. Even like people that I know that will send me their bio, I'm like, I didn't know this. But they're like, oh, yeah, I know, it's just this thing I did. But <laughs> they don't feel that comfortable to like shout about their achievements. So it means that we've got an opportunity for for people to connect um, and for people to talk more about sort of who's attending. And then we do... Um, sort of we've done like conferences and like a magazine that's like a how-to guide to can which is very practical and it sort of tells people like where to go where to drink where to eat sort of the mistakes to avoid things to pack all the kind of stuff that you'd want to know when you're going on a trip like this uh, and that is for men and for women it's not just um aimed at women but so that people feel less alone and they feel less like out of their depth and all the barriers that stop you from doing something like going to can can hopefully be broken down bit by bit and hopefully the barriers that people have about their hesitancies about going they then feel like they're part of something like part of the she squad so then they meet on the street and they're like oh i'm doing this you know i'm part of the she squad and then someone else is as well and then they find common ground to connect with we have these little badges that we give out and everyone wears them on their lanyards and the croissette is like normally full of people wearing the badges and men wear them as well. And the reason the men wear them is to show their support, to say, I'm supporting the women who are at Cannes and I want to help and I want to show that I'm on your side. Um, so it gives them an opportunity because a lot of men are crying out for ways in how they can vocally show their support of women as well. Mm. So it means that they've got an opportunity to have that. Um, and it's a conversation starter for them as well. So then they can sort of start thinking actively about how they can involve more women in their projects and involve more equality um and then also we're doing this year we're doing like a party list and events list of interesting events that are like conferences and things that women are speaking or films that women are showing so again there's like a place they can look where they can kind of see 
female focused things that they want to go to and again men who might want to attend as well because a lot of the female events they let men come to as well it's not only for women but it's meant to be a place where we have a moment to think about how we can involve more women in the in the festival so then they can see that and be like i would like to go and support the africa in women event that is happening and i want to know how i can encourage and support more people you know in that particular area and i want to learn how i can be better as well so it's kind you of you are a true true inspiration aren't you You're a true pioneer <laughs> massive it's incredible no, no it's it absolutely really amazing and it, it definitely needs to be a thing absolutely because the the whole me too thing that's come out was just shocking and it you know as as a guy i was, I was actually quite embarrassed like I, I was i can't believe this shit still fucking happens and it's now 2023 and you're still getting stories every now and again. You're like, why? Why are people dicks? Like, yeah. Just stop. Just stop being a prick. There's no need for it. There's no need for it now. Like, we all need to stand together as one. Be kind to each other and fucking support each other. Because, yeah. yeah. So, it's massive, like, big, big up massively because that's incredible what you do. Uh, <laughs> I don't. I don't feel like it's incredible. I feel like it's like something that I see as a need that needs helping and there are tangible ways I can do something. So I feel grateful that I'm able to do that. And I know personally a lot of women who've attended the festival because of us. And that makes me so happy that I can see that they've gone and I can see what they've got out of it. And like that makes me feel like it's for me almost. Cause I'm like, look at that awesome woman going and doing that thing. Yeah. Cause we were able to help her. So I feel like it's a blessing that I've got the opportunity to be able to do something like that um not everyone is able to or has time or you know has the resources so i feel it's like a responsibility as well to like use what i can because it's it's easy to preach to other people isn't it like you go use your you know you why don't you put someone in your magazine or in your podcast and and you know you do something but it's like okay great you can tell people to do something but what are you doing like what am i doing so it's something I can do. And there's lots of people that do amazing things as well. Like the female film club are there this year. Um, and they obviously have a whole film club about women in film. And then there's women in film TV and there's loads of different organizations doing things. Um, but we can hopefully like tap into something that's not being done within that and then support all of those within that. And I hope that other people can also look at what they're doing and say, how can I also support, in some small way because if everyone does a small thing to support in some small way imagine the difference i mean look at what happened with straws for god's sake <laughs> <laughs> that was one piece of plastic that they were like straws we're gonna get rid of all straws and we're gonna have flopping soggy straws instead but <laughs> the, i'm not saying that was a great thing for the world is like in terms of beverages but in terms of like plastic <laughs> seems to be going well but that's like one little thing. So, you know. Fantastic. But like you said, you know, there's so many people that notice these things, but don't do anything about it. And the yeah. fact you are is another reason why we tip the hat because it's phenomenal that you're doing this and the fact you recognise the need to do it. So instead of going, need to do it, it? Shame. You're yeah. actually going, no, I'm going to fucking do it then. And yeah. it's brilliant. I, like I said, I tip my hat. Tom's going to tip it twice for me and him. <laughs> No, it's absolutely phenomenal. But before we let you get out of here, what are you working on at the moment? Anything coming up? I've saw you on Twitter. You're wearing your mermaid tail again. I am. Yes. So, um, the, so the next project I'm doing is like a bit different from what we've done already. It's a dark fantasy about mermaids in Italy, and I am playing a mermaid in the movie, and I'm writing it, um, and directing it and producing it <clears throat> so I'll obviously be getting some help with all of those things as well um but yeah so it's a it's a dark fantasy um about a girl who is crippled by a mysterious illness and it's kind of showing similar symptoms to the things that I've been through physically um and she has to go to Italy to find her birth parents to find out what's wrong with her and why she's losing the use of her legs um and obviously when she gets to Italy she discovers that the town is a mermaid murdering cult that kill mermaids and drink their blood as you do um, yeah. and then she also discovers that she is a mermaid herself but she's a cursed mermaid so she doesn't have a tail and she doesn't know quite 
what's wrong with her. Um, but she has to find out what's wrong with her and then ultimately save the town from their evil master um, before everybody's lives goes to shit. So, yeah. <laughs> I feel like this is your way of saying these back problems I had. It'd be a real good payoff if I was a mermaid at the end of the day. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. It, it's, there's a lot of things that I relate to her with, like Azrai is the main character in the title of the film. And I feel like there's a lot of things that I relate to her with in that sense. But it's meant to be like Pan's Labyrinth kind of dark fantasy, beautiful etheralness. But with like mermaids in Italy and like the beautiful kind of sea and that kind of thing. So it's very dark. It's not for little mermaid fans necessarily. Um, but it's ultimately it's all about love and abandonment and rejection and feeling unwanted and feeling lost in society and all those heavy, rich traumatizing, exciting things um, all wrapped up in this like, horror fantasy kind of thing so it's a very ambitious project to be taking on and um, especially at the indie film level where we don't have 100 million quid or whatever like some of the bigger studios do um but i think it's going to have that like authentic gritty indie feel to it while also um hopefully having really cool mermaid plans and really kind of exciting but interesting dark grittiness to it like everyone is no, neither bad nor good in this movie we don't play into the whole um villain goody kind of vibes it's all about people do everybody does good and bad things and everybody thinks that what they're doing is what's best and everybody is really, really traumatized um and really fucked up in their own different ways so phenomenal i that sounds incredible <laughs> <laughs> mr stevens do you have any more questions for our incredible guest i do i know i've been here a while so i'll be quick <laughs> did you ever think that when you first started out you know playing scar in the lion king with your friends to raise money for the wwf that you would be here today doing indie movies directing producing acting and have your own phenomenal yes we can char yes you can charity <laughs> Um, no, I didn't, honestly. <laughs> I feel very blessed that this has become what m my life is, because obviously at one point I was like lying in the road trying to get hit by a car. And then years later, this is what this is what life has become, you know. So, um, yeah, I think it's like you never really know what, what's going to happen and what direction your life is really going to go in. And obviously... I used to dream of winning Oscars and I used to say that I am, um, I want three Oscars because the first one, it could have been a fluke. And the second one, still not sure. But by the third one, you're like, no, yeah, they definitely meant to give you that Oscar by the time you've got <laughs> So I've always had very high aspirations for <laughs> my career. I wasn't like, oh, maybe I'll do a bit of theatre and I'll just muddle along. I was like, yeah, so I'm like, yeah, 10 years old and I'm, drawing pictures of my Oscars, like, yeah, that's the plan. Um, so we're working on the way there, maybe, if the Academy like me. Um, but it's incredible, like, when you take a step back, because when you're in it, it's your life and it's your world and you're just walking your dog and taking your kid to school and doing the washing up. And then in between, you get these mad moments of film screenings and craziness in between. But my life feels normal, like, everyday life like everybody else's but when you kind of step back and you're like oh yeah that is kind of cool that like we've achieved so much and it's only getting better it's only on an upward spiral at the moment so incredible you are absolutely <laughs> amazing before we let you go any plug social medias you want people to go check out uh so i'm on instagram um at Little Faith, L I L F A I F. I don't really know where it came from, but it's stuck. But if you put Faith Elizabeth, you'll find me. Um, Twitter, I'm one Faith Elizabeth, the number one. Again, I don't know why, because this is not what you're meant to do. You're meant to have the same handle across everything. Um, Azraifilm.com is going to be up in the next few days. So if anyone wants to check that out and see what we're doing with that, that would be really cool. Um, we're going to be raising money and selling a little bit of merchandise and stuff to get 
kept the ball rolling on that project. And I know money's tight and it's difficult right now, but if you want a t-shirt with my face on it as the mermaid or whatever, then maybe that floats your boat. I don't know. Um, but yeah, just check out what we're doing. And if you're going to Cannes or thinking about going to Cannes, go to yeshecan.com, reach out and let me know if you're interested or if you want any advice or anything, or if you are going and you want to join the She Squad or you want to attend anything that we're doing. So. <laughs> Phenomenal. Absolutely phenomenal. Thank you so much for taking your, t- your Monday evening out to sit and chat to us. I really, really enjoyed this. Thank you so yeah, much. It's been fun. Thank you for having me. It's been really good. No, I oh. really appreciate it. It's been amazing. Fab. All right. All right. Take care yourself. See you, See you soon. Take See you care. Bye bye. Bye. What an incredible incredible conversation. This oh. is why I say with this show, if you've never even heard of the guest, listen to it. Because we have them on this for, on this show because their stories are absolutely incredible to listen to. And this is a shining example of why you should always listen. Because, yeah, this is beautiful. And please go out there, support Faith and everything she's doing. I cannot wait to see these movies she's working on in the minute. They sound absolutely amazing. And, yeah, again, like I said earlier, just a massive thank you to Faith for putting that trust in us. My second, Jamie. Faith, thank you so much for taking time with your very, very busy schedule. Uh, to sit and chat with us it was absolutely incredible um yeah and we hope that you all enjoy listening to it as much as we did recording it <laughs>